Frogman Friday. Yeah, boy. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Frogman Friday. I'm Ryan Birdman Parrot. Today, our badass guest is Jason Redman, a.k.a. Jay. He served 21 years as a Navy SEAL, exiting service as a lieutenant prior enlisted. He founded Soft Spoken in 2012 in Chesapeake, Virginia. You can follow Jay on social media, handles to follow the show. To learn more about Soft Spoken, go check out jasonredman.com. Brother, welcome to the show. Ryan, good to see you, brother. Thanks, yeah, for, you too. thanks for everything you're doing, man. It's awesome. Dude, this is, this is so much fun. Man, I'm so excited to talk to you today because you do so much. I mean, since I got up and watching you turn and burn, I'm like, how am I going to catch this guy? Because <laughs> that's how it is, right? In the teams, we're always like, how do I beat you today? How do I beat you today? But with you, I was like watching this insane upward trajectory, and I'm like, okay, I got to find somebody else to emulate because this dude's just on a track. So <laughs> let's dig into it. First, tell me about Soft Spoken. What is it? What are you doing with it? And why did you found it? Yeah, Soft Spoken is uh, my company that focuses on really its heart and soul that focuses on leadership and resiliency. Um, you know, one of the things that I think makes me unique is uh, I once failed as a leader. You know, that's really the heart and soul. I think there's a lot of people that may, maybe they haven't read, you know, my first book, The Trident, but that's what The Trident's about. It's about as a young leader, I totally screwed up, man. I got off track. I mean, you know, people who may or may not know me, I almost got myself kicked out of the SEAL teams for my own ego and arrogance and really just, you know, poor leading of myself back then, just kind of a mismanagement of all of that. And uh, it was a big time wake up call for me. Um, and thank God that some of the leadership believed in me and said, hey, you know, you got a lot of potential. We just need to humble you. And that kind of started that whole new path in uh, 2004. Uh, 2005, where I got to really grow up and became this big student in leadership and just trying to figure it out and become a better leader. Um, and, and because of that, it made me watch lots of leaders. It made me analyze a lot of leaders that we saw on the teams. The teams has amazing people. You see amazing levels of leadership, but you see both good and bad and different styles of leadership. So I became this student of leadership on all of that. So getting out, I just said, you know what? These are things that um, I could share with people. And that started down that path. I, I saw when I started my own nonprofit after I got out um, that the civilian world is very different. It does things very different. There's a lot of companies and individuals who are struggling to be better leaders that frequently they um, misunderstand management and leadership. Um, you know, they want to be good leaders, but really all they're doing is being average managers. So, and then throw in the component of resiliency and, you know, which in my opinion in this country is on the decline. Uh, we're not raising our kids to be resilient. We're not raising individuals to be resilient. So our <laughs> resiliency is going down at the same time, the level of uh, adversity we're facing in the world just continues to increase with all the craziness of this and that. So anyways, all of that came together for me to form soft spoken and create both, you know, speaking and now we're branching into workshops and consulting and coaching to help people be better leaders and better balanced versions of themselves. Um, I will say the last component part of leadership, and it's something you and I were talking directly about, is how well you take care of yourself. Because it's not just it's not just up here and here that makes a good leader. It's the entire thing. So how well you feel. So nutrition, sleep, fitness, all these different things are a foundational level. I try to explain to people um, that will make you a better leader. You will manage your emotions. Mentally, you're more positive. All these things play into being a good leader that for a lot of people, especially as we get older, those are things we don't think about. As a matter of fact, most people don't incorporate them into their lives. So it, it's that balanced approach that I try and bring. It's that focus on being, uh, at the end of the day, if you get off track, like I did, it's how well you lead yourself. It's how well you build an overcome mindset and be positive. And those are the things that I'm bringing into companies uh, or teams or organizations. So this is interesting because, you know, obviously a lot of SEALs are very articulate, even though they don't talk much and it's just a different community. Um, you're incredibly articulate, but Tell me, walk me through the path of getting out being a operator, which we don't tell anybody outside of our little niche group of, hey, guess what? I'm an operator and your teammate looks and you're like, yeah, so am I. And you're like, okay, cool. And you move back to your life, right? 
but now you're in this public sector and you're talking in front of people. That's a very, that's a scary thing, essentially. And a lot of guys can't figure that out in coming from the military too. So what drives you to really be able to convert your message from a military to the civilian world? And then what influences you to, uh, you know, continue to do that? Well, first off, I think that progression um, happened while I was still in the military. And never once did I ever um, did I ever think about writing a book or did I ever think about, you know, someday I'm going to speak. I'll be honest, man, I really wanted to do 30 years in the teams. I wanted someday to hopefully command a SEAL team. I wanted to serve a damn neck. I mean, these were my life goals. And, and often, as frequently happens in life, I mean, I speak about this, that I survived an enemy ambush, but everybody gets ambushed in life. Uh, and, and my enemy ambush directly led to a secondary effect or a secondary ambush, what I call a life ambush, because it really did bring an end to my operational career. Um, I never operated again after I was severely injured. Um, I got to finish my career, but I was never able to operate again. Um, but because of some of those things that happened, I started getting requests within the military and even within the nonprofit sector to, hey, would you be willing to come tell your story? Tell us about the sign on the door. Tell us about these injuries you overcame. So um, it made me realize that, hey, there's power in my story and people are looking for that. People are looking to be motivated, inspired. All of us. I mean, all of us do it. We look at other team guys. We look at other leaders. We look at other individuals to learn from them and the things they've been through to figure out, oh, this is how I can do that. I mean, the teams were, or the military in general, we joke about that, that plagiarism is, uh, is, is, you know, you see how somebody does something or how somebody writes something in the military, you just take it, you, you know, you redo it for yourself, but that's life too. And uh, it just made me realize that I could make a difference out there with my story. So it, it, it happened naturally. I mean, it's funny. I go back and I look at some of those really early speeches and I wasn't that great. Um, but like anything, you get better with time, the more you work on stuff. And I really put a lot of time into my craft. I really focused on content development and delivery and how do you craft a good speech and how do you deliver it? And most importantly, how do you make it relatable? There's a lot of great speakers out there who, or individuals who have great content, but it's not relatable when you're done with it. When you're done listening, you're like, wow, that was really amazing. I have no idea how to implement that in my life. You know, you don't walk away with that. And that was one of the biggest things I wanted to say, hey, look, man, the SEAL teams teach us amazing lessons. But at the end of the day, um, we are not superheroes. We are not um, we're not any different from anybody else, aside from the fact that we can endure probably stress and discomfort and pain longer than maybe the average person. But leadership and teamwork and resiliency and our ability to adapt to changing and chaotic environments, those are human traits. So taking that information and making it relatable. So that's kind of how all of this happened. And I constantly, I never, I'm constantly trying to build new content. I'm constantly looking at what's happening in the world. And I just say, how does this relate? How, how does the average person out there in a company or, or even just a mom or dad, how do they take this and make it applicable to, in their life to make them a better person, a better mom, a better dad, a better brother, sister, company leader, uh, whatever it is. And, and that's been my focus. And that has seemed to work pretty well. Well, see, that's beautiful because I've tried speaking before and um the things that come out of my mouth typically are garbage because I truly speak my mind. Um, but I'm also up there purely to be a comedian, not to be a speaker. But doing my first couple of speeches, I really realized that for me, it's the most important, the most powerful weapon that we have today is our voice. And if we use it correctly, we can actually affect change. And so that's what drove me to want to do it more when I was very skeptical about doing it. Now, I mean, I was crapping my pants speaking to 30 people. You're on this massive stage every, every week, talking to thousands of people. It's just a whole nother ball game. But, you know, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people like, hey, you know, Jay Redman? I was like, yeah, sure do. It's like, dude, guy, guy motivated me so hardcore. I was like, yeah, I got to figure out how to do that. So applaud you, man, because you are making change. You know, it's for speakers, you get done with your speech. And then your people will come up to you right away and say, that was amazing. But you don't truly get the aftermath, the months after 
of what you did to truly affect somebody. But I did because I heard it from, you know, my friends about you. So just knowing that, you know, you're getting, you're sending that wave effect out to everybody is super cool, man. And I appreciate you telling your story. Um, that's more important than anything because it's hard to relive your worst times of your life every single time you're on stage because everybody else goes away feeling motivated and you go back reliving that dream, that, that horrible sometimes dream. But the fact that you're willing to step above that and to help others is truly remarkable. It's yeah, awesome. but with time, and this is one of the big things I try and talk to people and other wounded warriors and individuals that have been through traumatic events, you know, the, 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 and Jimmy Hatch said it best when Jimmy wrote in his book, Touching the Dragon, and the dragon is that, that trauma, you know, whatever incident that you've been through in your life and they're cumulative, that, that becomes the dragon. And for most of us, especially tough type A dudes, we have a tendency to stick that in the back of our mind and just put it in a box and be like, oh yeah, I can tuck this away because I'm strong enough and I can just ignore it and it'll go away. But as Jimmy explains, unfortunately, something triggers it and suddenly this dragon breaks out and it fucking eats you. Yeah. And, uh, and the reality is um, if you talk about it, you over time, you, you learn to own it and instead of it owning you. And it never, it, it, it never heals totally, if you will. I tell people that, you know, I will always carry these physical scars, just like I carry the mental and emotional ones. But the more I talk about it, the more I see that I can help people like you talked about, dude, that's powerful. And uh, so I try and encourage every guy I meet, hey, man, talk about what you went through. Like, I know it's hard, but the more you do it, the more you'll own it. And that's why I think people can relate to, a lot of my message. I mean, it's authentic. It's relatable. I don't pull any punches. I say, Hey man, I failed as a leader, you know, like, like they were ready to kick me out, failed. Um, and I was suicidal. I, in Afghanistan, I put a gun in my mouth and I was ready to pull that trigger. And thank God, you know, the, the big man above made me look at that desk and see the pictures of my wife and kids and say, what are you doing? Um, and it stopped me you know, or, or when I was severely wounded and I lay in that hospital bed and they were telling me they were going to amputate my arm and like, you know, all this stuff, like, okay, you know, where do we go from here? I mean, everybody can relate to those things. You know, everybody's had these hard moments in their life. It's part of being human. <laughs> yeah. So, being a survivor. so yeah, that, that's the goal, man. That's, that's the goal. That's awesome, man. Well, you know, I've got these beautiful books behind you. Let's talk a little bit about those. So you said you wrote the Trident, obviously. Uh, walk us through the the process of writing the trident and then go through the rest of your books. Um, kind of give us a little taste of which what each one is. Yeah, the try I, I break them down. The, the trident is the story, overcome is the how-to, and point the new point man planner is more of a a, a guide, a, a daily, you know, monthly and quarterly guide. Um, <laughs> The Trident came to be, I never intended to write a book. I mean, I was still active duty, obviously, in the hospital. And what happened is I was traked and wired shut. I couldn't, I couldn't talk. Uh, and, you know, team guys would come to visit. And, of course, all team guys, we want to know, tell us what happened. You know, we want to hear about it. So I had to write it all out. And I've always liked to write. You know, I've written since I was kind of younger. And there was, there was some healing in that. So I started writing more. It kind of became the thing I did after surgeries and, you know, 40 surgeries over four years, uh, I had a lot of opportunity. So I just started writing about more about some of the other missions we did in Afghanistan, which led me into our Afghanistan deployment when I was, uh, uh, when I screwed up. So I started writing about that. And at that point I had about 200 pages. I was actually sta stationed at a uh, development group at that time, working in operations and, um, and it was right about the time a couple of books came out that the community wasn't that happy about. Um, and I had friends who were saying, you should do something with this. So I went to our uh, command master chief at the command at that time, who was my old master chief at Team 10. And I said, hey, will you take a look at this? Um, I never really intended to write a book, but I've had a lot of people read this and let me know what you think. And, uh, and he read it and he came back to me and he said, Hey man, it's super humble. You're telling your story. He said, this, this is the kind of story that should be out there. Um, so they gave me the green light. I sent it up to Warcom and, and then I got connected with a, uh, another guy that helped me write. Um, 
And, and that's how the Trident came to be. It took about five years from the time I started until it, it came to be what it was. But I'm really proud of it. I love it when people read it and say, that was totally not what I expected. It was better. I expected this chest thumping story of what a badass you are on the battlefield. And it ain't any of that. I mean, I'm, I'm not that guy. I would never, you know, I, I was a good seal. I stand by, you know, what I've done, but I also made mistakes in my career. And I think people can learn from that. I tell people it's never too late. So that's tried it. Overcome became the how-to. Everybody read the Trident and was like, dude, how did you do that? How did you overcome this failure? How did you overcome your battlefield injuries? You know, you drove forward and did all these really amazing positive things. And I'll be honest, I couldn't answer, I couldn't truly answer those questions or at least not give people a step-by-step -step process. So Overcome really took about, um, it took six years. I mean, Trident released in 2013, kind of took six years to really put down all this content and say, hey man, here's a step-by-step -step process. That's where the idea of getting off the X uh, in our lives came to be. I mean, in the SEAL teams, that phrase makes sense to us, but really it makes sense to anybody when they hear it and they think about, man, we get stuck on the X in our mind. We get stuck on the X with bad things. So really explaining this idea of how we all encounter life ambushes but the formula that we basically learn to conduct operations and to be successful, it translates to your own life. And that's what Overcome became is the how to, how to deal with adversity and how to lead yourself to success. And then Point Man Planner was just this idea that I served with some amazing point men in my career. I started out my career as a point man um, and then I walked rear security. So I really had a good understanding of uh, how our appointment work and then later becoming a, a officer we had incredible point recce teams uh overseas and the guys that worked for me or with me were just incredible um and it made me think um i'll be honest what happened is in 20 um 2021 i got really sick i got a blood disorder and that turn that um for a while there they were calling they thought maybe it was cancer it was <laughs> scary i thought i was dying and I remember thinking, man, I was all alone. I wasn't in the teams anymore. And I remember thinking, God, I wish I had a point man to help me get out of this situation, you know, because they're so good at navigating and looking at the threats and all these things. And one day I, it made me think a lot deeper, like, OK, well, what you know, you've always thought about this. Well, what really makes a good point? Man? And I realized there were four principles, if you will, that make a great point. Man. Number one is relentless belief in the mission. Number two is a, a, a clearly defined destination and a set course to get to that destination. Number three is uh, risk assessment and, and a strong awareness of the indicators of the threats as we're moving to and from that destination. And then number four is an overcome mindset to get off the X when shit goes to to, to hell in a handbasket. And, and when I wrote those down, I was like, man, these, these are really the secrets to be successful in life too. You know, if you can define these things in your own life, you'll, you'll be successful. So those are the three books. Uh, I speak on all those different things at different events and try and share them with other people. I just, in an, in a world of negativity, man, I just try and focus on being positive and trying to help people uh, you know, you and I were talking about this in the beginning, you know, everybody wants to sling mud at everybody else in this day and age. And the question is, well, how well do you lead yourself? You know, if you want to sling mud at everybody else, are you really that, uh, you know, it comes back to that old adage, don't throw stones in glass houses. So I focus on trying to help people focus inward because you and I both know if you're effectively leading yourself, you'll be successful. If all you're ever doing is focusing outward, you're just yeah. going to struggle and be negative and miserable. That's right, brother. Well, wow. wow. That's pretty amazing. Now, where can people get copies of these books? Uh, you can buy them at any major bookstore uh, or Amazon. Although if you want signed copies, if you come to jasonredman.com, it'll take you to my online store and coaching. Uh, and, and we sell signed copies there. Sweet. So you do all this. You've written all these books. And, and I sell these books. You've written these books. And you're speaking constantly and you're doing more than just that. You're doing nonprofit work. So tell me about some of the causes that you're a part of, what influences you with them and uh, what you guys, what your missions are. Yeah, we, um, I ran my own nonprofit for quite a few years, Wounded Wear, that evolved into the Combat Wounded Coalition. And um, 
we were doing some great stuff, but I'll be honest, um, more and more guys in, you know, probably, well, it started in 2013 with, with Dave Collins and it just continued every year. I kept seeing more and more guys kill themselves. Um, and, and it culminated with a friend of mine, uh, senior chief, Ron Condry, who was an EOD guy. And Ron was actually supposed to go through one of our programs we had built only a couple of weeks later. Um, it was supposed to start in October of 2000. Uh, 17, I believe, 2018. And um, then I got the call that Ron had killed himself in front of his wife. Um, and it broke my heart. And it also finally kind of made me say, okay, what we're doing is not working. Um, and what I was doing with our nonprofit was not working. So, and I said, instead of trying to shift focus, at that point in time, there were 43,000 nonprofits in uh, America. I don't know what we're, I've heard that number has been going down, but that's a lot that, you know, that kind of muddies the water. People don't know where do I donate? Where do I make a difference? And I felt like mental health and TBI was one of the biggest areas we needed to look at. So um, I ended up working with a group called um, getheadstrong.org, who has built a network of psycholog psychologists and psychiatrists across the country to support combat veterans. Um, and they're really doing a good job. They're oftentimes combat vets are afraid to seek mental health, one, because of the stigma, one, they think they're weak. And one of the biggest reasons they don't is they feel like, oh, this will impact my clearance and I won't be able to get a job on the outside or I'll lose my job in the military. So Get Headstrong actually does it off the record. They create a ghost record for these guys and gals. And I think that's critically important for people to know. And they have combat veterans who are doing the intake. So it's people who can say, I've been there, man. I, I, I can appreciate you. Um, I also saw that, you know, TBIs are the signature impact of this war. So I joined the um, Veterans Advisory Council for the Concussion Legacy Foundation. And they are the group that a lot of people may recognize that were focused on the concussion issues in the NFL. Um, well, they started to realize and, and CTE within NFL athletes. So some of these athletes that were killing themselves, they were seeing that they had pretty severe CTE postmortem. Um, well, they started to figure out and we started seeing that, that there was a lot of special operations guys that have that were killing themselves and postmortem. We were seeing that they had severe CTE. Dave Collins did. Um, uh, Larkin, um, Ryan, Ryan Larkin did, um, and quite a few other guys after the fact have Ron Condry. So there is no, the problem is there's no way to diagnose this right now. They don't know. We don't have the medical technology. The biomarkers aren't there. So concussion legacy foundation has expanded into a program to really do that brain research. But in order to do that, we need brain. So, uh, myself, Marcus Luttrell, some other guys donated our brains to the brain bank. Um, you know, they don't collect early. Uh, you know, they, uh, nobody's going to show up and be like, Hey, time's up, bro. We need that brain. I was just about to say like this conversation is starting to make a lot more sense now that you just said that. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always joke that, you know, they gave me quarter credit for mine. So, you know, <laughs> a little pea brain, but, um, but they will take those. I mean, it, when you pass away, no different than donating in other organs, they will know, Hey, he's a brain donor. And now it will go into the brain bank and they're going to be able to look at my brain with all the 21 years of special operations and exposures to blast and jumping and all these things. They're going to be able to look at my brain and say, Hey man, you know, to be able to analyze and study it and hopefully someday have an answer to be able to both diagnose and maybe treat. So um, I'm also working with a group, Resilient Warrior Foundation. I just recently joined. Uh, I'm an advisory board member for them. We're seeing that um, that guys miss the camaraderie of men and, and warriors, I should say. So I don't want to just say men, but warriors miss the camaraderie of being together and, and of fighting. You know, I mean, there's just something about fighting that brings people together. Uh, and jujitsu is one of the things, martial arts is one of the things, but in this case, Resilient Warrior focuses on jujitsu. So they are uh, enabling wounded warriors who want to get back into it. They're funding them to go train in jujitsu. And it's a smaller organization now, they're growing. So uh, if you are an organization out there who's looking to fund things like that, if you 
think or you are a fan of martial arts, then uh, let me know or reach out to Resilient Warrior Foundation because uh, sponsoring Wounded Warrior isn't a whole lot, man. It's, uh, you know, anywhere from 150 to roughly $200 a month to sponsor a warrior to go train at a facility. And uh, so I'm really a big fan of what they're doing. Then the last thing, Seal Legacy Foundation, obviously you and I were talking about that. Our, our SEAL brothers are struggling and, uh, and I want to get back in and do more with them. And uh, they have built an amazing network and this 360 degree approach on everything from physical well-being to mental well-being to emotional well-being to um, job and financial well-being. How do we connect guys and help them to navigate the, the crazy world that is the civilian world? Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be working with those guys. You're amazing, dude. What you've done in your career is amazing, especially I could say that because I only did eight years in the military. So, you know, to you to actually finish it off and then all that you're accomplishing now, you know, I applaud you. You're, you're a rock star and somebody to be looked up to. I do. Hey, thank you. Yeah, man. Let's finalize on this. Tell me a story or tell me about some brother of yours that you want to honor, something that people wouldn't know. Um, wow. Um, something that people would not know. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I did write about this in my book, but, you know, I, I, I was originally assigned to, uh, SEAL Team 10 Echo Platoon, uh, which is the, um, is the, platoon that was on the helicopter that was shot down in Lone Survivor. Um, Mike McGreevy was a friend of mine, um, and he was the OIC of that platoon. And Mike actually came, him and the chief came to me when I was still in school and said, hey, Red, we want you to be in our platoon. And I was originally in that platoon for about four months, three or four months before I got moved uh, over to Foxtrot platoon. Um, you know, so I trained, we trained right alongside those guys. Uh, Eric Christensen was our troop commander. Mike was obviously the OIC of Echo. Um, and uh, um, Jacques Fontaine, you know, Jeff Taylor, Jeff Lucas, all those guys we work with day in and day out. Um, and just, you know, all of them were amazing and unique personalities. I mean, Mike, if you ever knew him, he was just incredible. Um, this was a caliber that Mike was. Mike was incredibly well read, read. We had lots of conversations all the time. And this was also during a time I was kind of struggling as a young leader. I was making some mistakes and I frequently would go talk to Mike about some of those challenges. And he always gave such good advice. Our daughters are not far. My youngest daughter and his daughter are not far off in age. You know, our wives were pregnant about the same time. So we would frequently talk about those things. Um, but Mike, super well read. He would always bring up examples from books. And uh, but one of the biggest things I remember about him was we were doing um, we were doing land navigation and reconnaissance training in Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, and um, and a lot of us had gotten into poison ivy pretty bad. So, but it wasn't so bad that we needed to get pulled out or anything like that. You know, we're team guys deal with it. Well, Mike got it all over his face and it got into his eyes and his eyes were all swollen and he was totally, he was messed up and they pulled him out and they took him to the ER to get treated. Well, in, and he was treated, they gave him the medicine, but instead of coming back and like trying to relax and do what they did. What did he do? He managed to convince, I mean, one of the training instructors and one of the guys to take him uh, to one of the local pizza places. He bought a whole bunch of pizzas and he brought all these pizzas out to the field to the guys. Um, so that, that was the caliber of Mike McGreevy. And it just, it breaks my heart to, you know, to think that he's no longer here. Um, but he was a good dude. Appreciate you sharing that brother. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't man. have I didn't have the privilege to uh, meet any of those guys uh, from the Halley, uh, but my platoon I was at SEAL Team Seven Alpha, and just before we were getting ready to deploy on that 05 deployment, um, the guys from SDV attached to us for a portion of our training. So we were with Murphy, Dietz, Axson, Saw, uh, Peyton, and uh, same feeling, man. You know, it's just you knew these guys, you worked with them, you get to see that you know 
just that caliber, especially a different group. It's always interesting when different platoons show up together. You're like, who are you? You know, kind of deal. Yeah, yeah. You're a seal, but you're not alpha just yet. No, kind of those deals. Um, and then just get that word was just, it was, I mean, it rocked every one of our lives in the teams. So, and we'll always do that. So, well, Jay, I appreciate you being on today, brother. We're going to get all this information out to everybody we know. Um, we're going to put all the handles to your nonprofits, to where to buy your books and to your company. Everybody, this is Jason Redman. You go check out jasonredman.com. Go sign up to have him speak to you, do a leadership development course, buy a copy of each book from his site so you get it personally autographed and then go check out the causes he supports because i know them they're awesome and he's doing awesome stuff so i love you brother brother back at you much love to you too so i love what you're doing i'm excited to see this upcoming year uh i think that's pretty fascinating i don't know if everybody knows but uh bird's got big things coming and i'm excited to see it it's it's definitely gonna help a lot of people Appreciate you saying that, brother. Now you just outed that project and now I'm going to go throw up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> hey, nobody knows what it is, dude. You could totally make something else up. You know, <laughs> I, I didn't give any details. Uh, I'm going to give a speech to 50 people. Whoa. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> right on, brother. Have a great day, man. All right. Thanks, brother.